and we can begin the program. Uh, I'm going to be here. Yeah, they lied. <laughs> Well, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to a program on democracy when you could be outside playing golf on such a beautiful day today. We are delighted uh, to have such a strong audience and to have all of you join us for what does promise to be a fascinating conversation. I personally am looking forward to this very much, uh, in part because all four panelists are personal friends of mine and people that I've worked with closely in the past and I like and admire their work, uh, but also because I think the topic is so timely and so interesting and so much in the news. Uh, and so much taken for granted in some ways, and we want to explore uh, what is democracy in the Americas, and what's its health, and what's its stake, and where do we go from here. So that's the purpose of the conversation today. Uh, my name's Eric Farnsworth. I head the Washington Office of the Council of the Americas. Uh, delighted to partner uh, institutionally with two other organizations, of course, the National Endowment for Democracy, whose beautiful space we're uh, availing ourselves of today, and so we thank Miriam, you and your colleagues for this opportunity and also to Florida International University, the Latin America and Caribbean Center. Uh, Frank and Eduardo, both uh, your presence here today and also institutionally your friendship and support, we appreciate very much. Uh, this is a, uh, a topic of, of wide interest and it was not difficult uh, um, determining who the partners could and, and perhaps should be for something like this and we're delighted that it, it really did work out. Well, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking forward to a timely and relevant conversation, and we chose the title today on purpose, after a little bit of thought, is Democracy Healthy uh, in the Americas? Uh, most people agree that democracy is secure as a governing system uh, in the Western Hemisphere and, and in Latin America, and that Latin America today is vastly better off than it was when many folks uh, started their careers, such as me, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when uh, democracy itself was so fresh and so new. Uh, but in some countries, the institutions of democracy are becoming troubled, they're becoming co-opted or cowed, uh, and in others, democratic institutions have already been bent to the will of the executive and in some cases subverted. Democracy has arrived, democracy exists, but the question is how healthy is it and where is it going from here? So before we move into the panel and do some brief introductions and ask them to uh, make some initial comments, we should probably define our terms. Everyone has their own definition of democracy, and maybe that's part of the problem, uh, because uh, everybody has their own vision of what democracy is or could or should be. But just like Justice Potter Stewart, I think we <laughs> probably all know it when we see it, right? <laughs> so let me just give a couple uh, characteristics of what, anyway, I believe we can probably all agree on that democracy is. But democracy includes the ability of people to vote regularly and freely for their leaders and an electoral process where the rules are transparent and everyone is able to compete on an equal basis. It means that there are regular and predictable turnovers of the executive, that there are separation of powers and institutions, including an independent administration of justice and a free press and a vibrant civil society and the ability to affiliate and speak freely without fear of intimidation or threat, including economic threat. You'll have your own definition, you'll have your own characteristics, but these are some that I think are commonly accepted as uh, important to the democratic process. And by these indicators, we know that not all nations across Latin America in the current moment enjoy healthy democracies. So we see, for example, what's going on right now, today, in fact, in Venezuela. We see what's going on right now, today, in Haiti. And we've been watching carefully political changes in Brazil and Argentina and the Dominican Republic. And we're also anticipating pending elections in Peru and later this year in Nicaragua as well. Lots of questions out there. More broadly, we need to understand trend lines and we also need to have a better handle on what tools the United States and the international community has at their disposal, have at their disposal to promote democracy in the Western Hemisphere. And so there's much going on and there's much at stake and we wanna talk about some of those issues today. Unfortunately, we don't have all afternoon to discuss these topics. Indeed, it would take a lot longer than that. So we're just gonna to touch on some of the topics, but I'm very much looking forward, as I said, to the conversation. You have the bios of the uh, panelists available to you, and I hope you'll take a quick look at them. Uh, all are experts in the field, all are uh, well known. So I'm not gonna go uh, into that background, but simply to call to your attention uh, the impressive nature of the panelists that we have before us. Uh, Cynthia McClintock uh, of George Washington University, 
Frank Mora of uh, FIU. Next to her, uh, next to Frank is Miriam Kornblith, again, of the National Endowment. And to the far side, uh, for me, is Eduardo Gamara. And don't read anything politically into that. Eduardo and I are great friends, so uh, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on which perspective you're looking at. So anyway, if you would all please join me in welcoming the panelists to the program today. <laughs> Well, as I mentioned, everybody has been focusing, and appropriately so, on the questions around Venezuela and Brazil. But I want to start with a country that is not so much in the news, just to broaden the perspective and start the conversation with Cynthia McClintock, who is a true expert on Peru. Uh, the elections in Peru are coming up June 5, Five. Mm -hmm. the second uh, round. Uh, and uh, she's written and spoken eloquently about some of the issues surrounding these elections. So, Cindy, how do you see them? Uh, how is uh, democracy in Peru? What can we expect in terms of the elections? And what would you uh, say to the audience about what to anticipate? Disturbing. Uh, I'd say perhaps Peru's democracy has had a cold uh, for a number of years and uh, could get pneumonia. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think probably not. But anyway, you've, you've raised really important questions, and it's great to be here with the other uh, panelists. Uh, as you mentioned, there hasn't been that much news, so the, the brief update on where Peru's elections stand, uh, the first round on April 10th, uh, the Fujimorista party, and again, the concern, of course, is the election of uh, Keiko Fujimori, the daughter you know, of the period when Peru's democracy went dead uh, in 2000. Uh, so her party won a majority in the legislature at that time. And right now, uh, there is a statistical tie between Keiko and the candidate, we usually call him PPK, uh, Pedro Pablo Kaczynski, uh, who was the runner-up uh, in, in the first round. Uh, in the first round, Keiko uh, won just a tad short of 40%. And Pepeca had 21%. Uh, so, so what's disturbing about this? What's, uh, what's disturbing? Uh, during the, the first round, there were very problematic disqualifications of candidates. I think this is a concept we're more accustomed to in Venezuela, know that candidates are disqualified. It was a very, very uh, problematic uh, development in Peru, totally new uh, for uh, Peru. Uh, a candidate called uh, Julio Guzman uh, who was very much in the mold of Peru's president. Uh, he was an outsider, positioned at the center left, sort of self-made, well-educated. He surged in the polls in February to overtake PPK by a good solid uh, margin. So uh, he was looking in very good shape, and then all of a sudden he was disqualified. The grounds for the disqualification were, was a uh, violation of internal party democracy norms uh, that the there had not been, I mean, this is, again, uh, what I think most of us in different organizations would consider very minor. There had not been a quorum at the election of the constitutional tribunal of uh, the party. Uh, very interestingly, in terms of the questions uh, that Eric has posed for us today, uh, OAS Secretary General Almagro was very much uh, at the forefront of criticism uh, of this disqualification. And he pointed out, uh, very rightly in my view, uh, most of my friends' views, uh, that one, the punishment was totally disproportionate to the crime, uh, and two, the timing. Now, this was six weeks or so before uh, the first round, which meant that there was very little media attention to other candidates, very little time for another candidate uh, to, to emerge. Again, very interestingly, in terms of the questions that Eric has posed, the U.S. Department of State, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has said nothing. Now, so, you now my own take was that, uh, of course, the Secretary General was quite criticized uh, by Peruvians, as you know, we're accustomed to this, to violations of sovereignty, et cetera. And, uh, he kind of was sort of left out to dry on this, as best as uh, you know, I could tell. Uh, you know, after the disqualification of Guzman, there, were further, there was a further disqualification of the candidate who'd been running uh, fourth, which for various reasons in itself was not quite so problematic. But the problem was that Keiko herself was accused of a very similar violation, and she was absolved. So the result of that was in polls, a majority of Peruvians saying that the electoral authorities were politically motivated. 
And the upshot was in a country that is already just so cynical, so cynical that null and blank voting, which had always been pretty high and proof, went up to 18 percent now of the total, which, as I was mentioning to Frank, by far the, the Latin American average is about 5 percent. So just a very, very worrisome set. In a country already, if you look at Latino barometer polls or lay polls, already you know, very dissatisfied with democracy, that it's gotten worse. So that's very, very uh, worrisome. And then, of course, going into the runoff, uh, the fact that Keiko was moving up in the polls. Uh, again, Pedro Pablo Kaczynski, as we just indicated, he was probably not you know, the strongest kind of, of candidate. Um, he, I don't like to say this, but probably in a lot of polls, the biggest point that people say is the guy is 77, he's on Ciano. <laughs> They're not that old. <laughs> Come on, give the guy a break. <laughs> but he is 77, and it's, it's a little tougher for him. It's a little tougher for him, and he comes from a background of international business. He's experienced. He's only worked in proving governments and democratic governments, so he's seen as honest, so these are all pluses. But no, there are also these these negatives, and he's, I'd say, kind of in our terms, perhaps sort of a, a liberal Republican, in a country in which you know, people are you know, probably more on the Bernie Sanders side, at least in terms of economics. So so it's kind of a stretch, you know, ideologically. So he's not an ideal, uh, you know, candidate. So Keiko had that uh, advantage, and she is, you know. She looks pretty well-spoken a lot of the time, but I think what's been revealed, if you've been following the news, and you have to be following it pretty closely, but in the news recently has been uh, the fact that the head of the Fujimorista party uh, is probably under investigation by the Drug Enforcement Administration for you know, money laundering for her campaign. Uh, and this has been quite a bombshell. And not only, obviously, the fears of the corruption that was endemic in her father's administration, but also her reaction to it. She was, again, sort of classic populist style. This had come out somewhat before, but it was more evident the last couple of days. Uh, very dismissive of journalists, insulting, you know, just not accepting uh, principles of debate, di dialogue, uh, trying to uh, blame, you know, blame anyone criticizing her for the, blame the messenger for the problem. So uh, that, you know, I think is, is going to, to damage her uh, significantly. But we do have these, you know, major concerns uh, about uh, the election. I probably need to stop there. Do you anticipate on June 5 a free and fair uh, election? Yes, I do. And, and again, we, amid my concerns in, about the, the first round, it was not that the count you know, was not fair. And as, as, as you said, I mean, a lot of these processes, the, you know, there could be an awful lot else wrong. And yet, <laughs> I think some of the bigger issues to me, too, are kind of the whether elections in many countries, including here, obviously a sine qua non to everything, but at the same time, there is this proclivity of candidates, you know, as we see in some of our own candidates, to promise the moon. And there isn't this kind of fact checker that says, no, that's really not going to happen overnight. And, and in the case of Keiko, you know, her calling card has been citizen security. This is a huge concern in Peru right now, just as it is in you know, the rest of Latin America, that organized crime, all of these problems are very, very severe. And her you know, Umala, the current uh, president, was elected in part because people said, you know, they didn't really look at his platform, but they said, hey, he's a military guy. He'll be able to solve this problem because the military is good at this. So, but now they're upset because he didn't solve it. In Keiko's case, they're saying, well, her father was good on uh, citizen security, so she'll, you know, have some answers. The fact is, she has nothing that I have seen in her platforms to suggest that she'll be good on this. She has no record suggesting she'll be good on this. But people kind of say, oh, well, she promises, you know, she makes some good promises. Yeah, yeah, let's, we, yeah. And then, of course, they're disappointed because this is also a hard problem. I mean, people, pr yeah, we're going to solve it. But as we all know here, you, you can't wave a magic wand and solve this in Latin America. It's a big, real problem. We've certainly given us a lot to think about. Thank you very much mm. for stimulating the beginning of the conversation. And I'm sure we'll come back to this and uh, pursue some of these topics further. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, very well done. Um, so let's jump over, Frank, and let's go to Miriam. Uh, and the reason why is because uh, Miriam's a true expert on Venezuela, being of Venezuelan background herself. And I'd love to 
get from you a perspective, an update perhaps on how you see Venezuela in the context of democracy, right, and democratic institutions, et cetera. And what we're trying to do is just put a couple data points out there. Perhaps you don't agree with everything that will be said or some of what's said, et cetera, et cetera. The purpose is to try to stimulate thinking and conversation today on what is the health of democracy in the region and where is it going. And frankly, we hope you don't agree with everything that's going to be said, uh, certainly that I'll say, right? But uh, with that in mind, uh, and I'm not suggesting you're not going to agree with what Miriam says, because uh, <laughs> I think she's terrific. Miriam, Venezuela, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Can you turn on your mic? Um, your, yeah. Thank you much, Eric, for the initiative and for the opportunity to be here with such good friends and colleagues and for having you here at that. Um, well, what can we say about the health of Venezuela? <laughs> Uh, I mean, in the framework of the health of Latin America, I think the worst case, uh, the worst country in terms of health is Venezuela. Uh, as uh, Eric started his remarks, uh, if we compare Latin America to the 80s, probably late 80s, Venez uh, Latin America looks much better. If we compare Latin America to the early 2000s, it probably looks worse. And I guess, from my perspective, the case that pinpoints the sharp regression in terms of democracy in the region is exactly Venezuela. Um, unfortunately, it's not only, it has o not only regressed, it continues to regress. And the country currently, I mean, I know there's a lot of information in the news, so I won't go into m much detail, but the country is facing a multifaceted uh, crisis in terms of economic performance, uh, health issues, uh, ability of the government to provide basic goods and services, the collapse of infrastructure, uh, as I said, uh, all sorts of health and social related uh, services. And on top of that, it's facing a massive energy crisis, which is totally paradoxical in, in the case of an oil producing country with huge hydroelectric uh, resources, and uh, still facing an ongoing and, and worsening uh, political crisis. So, in terms of uh, pinpointing just one country, we can see Venezuela is a very bad case in terms of democratic regression, but it also highlights uh, democratic regression uh, throughout the region, I would say, because one of the main hopes for the region in the early 2000s was the fact that we had a strong regional bodies such as the OAS with a very impressive inter-American democratic charter. So even at the beginning of the the regressive uh, process in Venezuela, may, many thought that the region will have the instruments to uh, at least uh, stop the regression or to introduce uh, s s uh, healthy, <laughs> we're talking about health, healthy changes in the democratic uh, and in the political process. And however, it's uh, the region has proven itself to be very ineffective and very uh, limited in its ability to uh, stop uh, democratic regression in Venezuela, to deal with uh, what the democratic, the international, inter-American democratic charter calls the alteration of the constitutional order, and we are facing currently the exactly that dilemma. I mean, internally, the country is going uh, to a very, it's, it's, it's heading to a, a critical, harsh confrontation between the government and the opposition. And internationally, well, we witnessed yesterday a very, very harsh, impressive response or uh, yeah, declaration by the uh, Secretary General of the OAS in regards to Maduro's recent accusations of him being part of a conspiracy, CIA, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we all, we've heard that for 17 years already, and I mean, this is in exact same terms. However, well, for the first time, the Secretary General is responding in, in a very open fashion. But this is only showing uh, how difficult it has been and how difficult it continues to be to channel the internal conflict, the internal com uh, confrontation through uh, what in Venezuela has become a mantra for the opposition, the constitutional, peaceful, democratic, and electoral path. The constitutional, the, the, excuse me, the opposition recently launched a constitutionally established enshrined 
uh, initiative, which is to call for a recall referendum after this, the half of the period of, of the president in, in office. This has uh, triggered a very, very aggressive response on the side of the government because uh, unlike the, the similar attempt that took place in the year 2003 through from 2003 to 2004, uh, when President Chavez was not uh, was not uh, facing high popularity numbers around figures around mid 2003, but ended up uh, improving significantly his uh, his figures, b uh, partially due to a s uh, significant increase in oil revenues and in oil international prices. Currently, the government is facing a very low point in terms of popularity and, and popular support in the midst of a terrible fiscal crisis and with no immediate possibility of reversing that fiscal crisis. So the referendum currently is a, thru, a true threat for the permanence of, uh, of a Maduro in, in office. So that has triggered a, a massive reaction on the side of the government. Two or three days ago, I mean, la at the end of last week, uh, the government declared a state of uh, emergency, a st uh, st uh, state of exception and emergency, which uh, it curtailed significantly, significantly uh, human rights and and basic uh, basic tenets of rule of law and and I mean the basic like, tenets of of, uh, of normal democracy. They are th threatening to uh, even expand this decree. Uh, the country is still facing this short, uh, this massive uh, situation of uh, multiple shortages, and uh, different demonstrations uh, that the, the opposition has called for in regards to pressing the CNE, which is the National Electoral Council, in charge of uh, carrying out all the processes associated with the referendum, uh, trying to press the CNE to uh, proceed as the rules have that are. Uh, you know, have established the, the path for calling for the referendum was met with massive dispropor disproportionate uh, repression. So these are elements that we have seen in the past that are still there, however, are combined in a very, uh, very m critical uh, <laughs> mix nowadays because of a lack of support of the government, because of acute a fiscal crisis because of uh, this m combined uh, energy and shortage and, and uh, food and, and services crisis, which is uh, leaving the government in a very weak position in terms of popular support. On the other hand, uh, the government is using its powerful sources of, uh, of um, powerful resources of being in power, such as uh, control of the institutions, control of the repressive apparatus, and uh, fear and, and intimidation. Op the opposition on, on its side has insisted systematically, at least since the presidential elections of 2006, but even before that, but at least since the presidential elections in 2006, to channel uh, conflict and channel confrontations through electoral uh, peaceful, democratic, and institutional uh, means. I mean, the, the opposition has participated in all the elections that have taken place throughout this the 18 period of Chavista and Madurista rule, but at least since 2006, with no hesitation, has expanded its uh, popular support through participating in elections, continues to, to uh, voice in a very clear fashion that that's the preferred uh, path, combined with popular mobilization, because it's just the situation nowadays is that the country is uh, experiencing at around, according to different reports, about 500 conflicts uh, uh, monthly, uh, yeah, on a monthly basis, all sorts of conflicts, like big conflicts and, or small conflicts, but it's, it's in a very a heightened conflictual uh, mood, and that has, and additionally, the country is, is facing very terrible expressions of uh, social conflict, including lynchings and including looting, and uh, on top of the highest rate of homicide 
uh, in, this, in, the, in South America and almost the highest rate of homicides uh, worldwide. So it is a very toxic mix. And as I said, unfortunately, the region, because that's one of the Eric's uh, focuses and, and questions, I guess we will talk more about it, so far has proven to be quite uh, limited in its ability to to address this and introduce meaningful uh, changes in, in a, a highly confrontational path. Yeah, and that's exactly one of the things that we want to explore in greater depth. What are the tools available? I'm going to ask Frank to address that in a bit. But um, from the international community, when you clearly have a case of a country that's going the wrong direction on the democracy spectrum, uh, in fact, some institutions have actually said that at this point Venezuela is no longer a democracy. Uh, I suppose that's debatable, but the point is that it's going in the wrong direction. What tools does the international community, including the United States, have to encourage, uh, you know, a, a pullback from the abyss? Uh, so that's a very pregnant question um, in, in terms of what, uh, what we may be anticipating. Thank you, Miriam. Very well said. Uh, well spoken. Eduardo, to you, um, some of the regional trends now. We focused on two countries uh, just as data points, um, not to say they're equal or anything like this, but just as data points. And so from your perspective, give us some trend lines in Latin America as you see it with other examples that you might care to bring into the conversation. Well, first let me... Yep, turn it on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. First, let me thank you, uh, Eric, for uh, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to to to, to be at uh, at events with you, and of course, it's a great pleasure to to see people whom some of whom I haven't seen for a long time, like Cynthia. But uh, and Frank, thanks for thanks for thinking of me when uh, when you put this together. Um, well, let me just uh, s sort of be provocative for for a moment. Uh, I mean, I think. A lot of what uh, what we're seeing, especially in uh, in the Andean region, and not that the Andean region is sort of, you know, setting the, the 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 trend, but I think there are a lot of things that are happening in the Andes that are really manifesting themselves throughout the region. Uh, one, of course, is the the, the big issue of having uh, at least three governments: uh, the Venezuelan, the Ecuadorian, and the Bolivian, who have over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, really been at the forefront of violating constitutional norms or, or at least changing constitutional norms to get themselves reelected. And with this perspective that only they are the ones who know best for their respective countries. And that in the context of, of great confrontation, only they are the ones who know uh, what, uh, you know, what is best for their, for their specific countries. And, and, and in some measure, it's this idea that the leader speaks for the people, as Evo Morales always says, you know, says, la voz del pueblo, eh, Evo, no, la voz del pueblo es la voz de Dios, and therefore, you know, uh, because he represents uh, the voice of the people, he, I guess, is sort of, a, sort of also, you know, kind of a, a deity. And in the Bolivian context, he is a deity, as, as in some measure Chavez was in, uh, in Venezuela and to a certain extent Correa. But this logic of modifying constitutional norms to stay in office, um, really runs against the grain, of course, of something you said very early, which is this, this notion that democracy is defined by regular, predictable alternation in, in, in power. And, uh, and I think increasingly, maybe that trend is reaching an end. Uh, and uh, perhaps the, the referendum that Bolivia held in, in February is kind of a bellwether of things to come in the, in the future. Although, again, we see even in the Bolivian case a, a dramatic situation where, you know, uh, in, in fact, today, if you follow the news very, 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 uh, very closely, there is already, you know, calls for, well, the, the president and the Bolivian people were duped by this, uh, this scandal with his girlfriend, his 17-year-old girlfriend and so on. And, uh, and therefore, the people were duped and they voted incorrectly. So let's redo the referendum so that we get the correct response. So... But I have a feeling that that trend, at least toward this, this characteristic that had become kind of a, a distinct, distinguishing feature of Andean democracy, at least, of changing the rules to prolong uh, the, 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 the presence of these individuals in power, may be at least turning uh, and may be uh, uh, coming to uh, uh, some, kind of, some kind of an end. But I also think it's important to analyze the opposition and uh, the opposition in all of these countries. And the opposition... Of course, and, and this, again, trying to be somewhat provocative, we academics and uh, many in the NGO communities, we spent a lot of time criticizing the role of political parties. 
And we continue to criticize the role of political parties. In fact, even in the United States, we think political parties are a disaster, they're unrepresentative, they're this, that, and the other. And by virtue of our analyses, we contributed to the collapse of the political party systems in the Andes. And in some measure gave rise to the kinds of alternative leaderships that, that, that prevail in the region. And now, of course, 15 years down the road, you know, we can do some kind of retrospective analysis of, of what the consequences are of having the dismantling, the collapse of the traditional party systems, and of course, the emergence of these alternatives, which largely are you know, uh, aimed at the concentration of executive power and really you know, the, the destruction of institutions, because it, only, it hasn't only been parties that have collapsed, but the institutions that surround the party systems have also have also collapsed. So, so I think it's important, sort of as a as a reflection, and you can see this. You know, while the I'm I'm talking about the Andes, but really you can see this throughout the region. And uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm not saying that that's the situation in the United States, but I think we have to we have to also think about you know how healthy our own democracy is, uh, given the the current electoral scenario. The third thing that, that I think is important just looking at this regionally is the, how significant corruption has become as uh, uh, something that very clearly affects governance. And, uh, and so here, let me say two things about, about corruption. On the one hand, you know, corruption is very, very much tied into uh, something that, uh, again, in, in, in our discipline historically, looking at corruption as an expression of political culture was kind of a no-no, right? We, we sort of said this was kind of an ethnocentric analysis and, and so on, but since I'm Bolivian, I guess I can say this, right? <laughs> but, but the reality is that, you know, uh, whether you, qu you qualified it as, as a Venezuelan, as, as, a, as a, you know, as something that comes out of the rentist culture or, so, or, or what have you, but the fact is that corruption has been very functional in, uh, in, in most of the region. And corruption is a very significant dimension of clientelistic politics. And clientelistic politics doesn't have an ideology. All right, corruption is not the you know the uh, the uh, the purview only of of liberal Democrats, of conservative Democrats, or populists, or what have you. Corruption is probably the most democratic of all forces in, in, in Latin America. Right? You know, you know, it and it's used really as a as a tool of governance. And the way in which corruption is used. It's, it's very interesting because if you're in government, the opposition is corrupt. If you're the opposition, then everybody in, in government is corrupt. And in the end, what I think has happened is that corruption has really, as a, as a value, has become extraordinarily delegitimized, right? It's very, it's, you know, I mean, it's very hard to, you know, objectively, you can look at it from, from the outside and say, you know, these people are extraordinarily corrupt. But let's take, for example, the case of Brazil right now, all right? Uh, you know, I mean, it's the, the evidence against uh, uh, the PT is overwhelming, right? It's absolutely overwhelming. I don't think anybody, you know, objectively can say that the evidence against Petrobras is not overwhelming. Yet at the same time, you have quite a lot of Brazilians today who are convinced that the impeachment process against Mrs. against Dilma Rousseff was absolutely politically motivated and had nothing to do with corruption, right? You have uh, Mr. Da Cunha defending himself today, saying that you know the charges against him are also politically motivated, and so in in a lot of ways, I think you know the, these these the way in which we have been really using corruption as a tool of criticism and as a tool of of governance. I think you know we need to look at these things a little bit more carefully. Uh, so what I'm saying is corruption both helps countries govern themselves, kind of a la Huntington, right? You know, the, the, that old question that Huntington always asked is one that I always ask my people, people in Latin America, who's out of place, right? He used to say, the guy who charges the police station claiming that there's corruption or the guy who simply pays the bribe and moves on. That's one way in which I think most of us have looked at corruption. And then the other is to basically say, you know, to be very, very political about it and therefore delegitimizing the whole logic of corruption. So why don't I leave it at that and you can... Some terrific <laughs> comments there, Edward. I'd love to unpack some of it and uh, really uh, broaden this out in a very effective way. And you did mention tools uh, in the conversation, tools to address some of these issues. So let's turn to uh, Frank uh, for that uh, 
at least to, to introduce some additional thoughts into the conversation. Frank, you're a creature of Washington. You've spent time in government. You've seen what works, what doesn't work, what <laughs> tools may be available, what <laughs> tools may not be available. Uh, and, and this changes over time, no? I mean, you know, as circumstances change, uh, some of the things available from a political perspective, things that the United States has available, and expectations, norms also change. Um, but in your comments, I'd also like you to comment to the extent you'd care to on um, the Inter-American Democratic Charter and if this is a, a tool that uh, at this point in history uh, can be effective, is effective, should be effective, and just give us some thoughts on that. And then I would ask the same question of all of you, not necessarily about the charter specifically, although if you have comments on that, please feel free to, to join in, but, but the tools. What can the international community do and defined as broadly, but certainly including the United States, how can we support democracy in the Western Hemisphere? Uh, should we even try, right? Some of these questions that are, are really, I think, uh, very pertinent. Frank, I've taken too much time. Over to you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Is, is my mic on? Uh, I don't think it is. I thought I did. <laughs> Should be green. Green. Yep. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> um, good to see old friends uh, again here in D.C. No? Oh, yeah? One, two? Good? Yep. I think so. I'll screen. Um, thanks again, Ari. So uh, I feel almost compelled to be optimistic in light of what everything my colleague <laughs> said about democracy. So I'll be optimistic, uh, and then I'll be pessimistic in the second round. <laughs> Um, first, the OAS and the, and the Charter. You know, I think we have to remind ourselves that the OAS is really the only international organization that has the tools to promote and defend democracy and human rights, the best instruments available to its members and the Secretary General that no other organization has in the world, right? The Commission, the Court, the charter, uh, electoral observation, et cetera. No other organization has that. So there is a historic, there is an institutional normative recognition about the importance of democracy uh, in the region, certainly since uh, the end of the Cold War. And that's a, important to remember and put in perspective. Um, in the last 40 eight to 72 hours, right? Uh, the Secretary General has been, uh, of the OAS, has been so blunt and, and so clear. Uh, I think no other Secretary General of any organization has been so leaning forward as, as he has. He has, as, gone, as you may know, has gone as far as to say that Venezuela is now basically a dictatorship, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, you know, uh, many of us may be surprised by that, uh, by, by him saying those things, but he's been very consistent. And, and I'll make a bit of a prediction here. I think, and Eric's been following this very closely about you know, the charters, is it dead? Are we going to rehabilitate this? Why, is, why are countries being so inconsistent in the implementation of democratic charters, Paraguay versus other cases, right? Well, I think that what we're going to see over the next few months is that the Secretary General, and it's within his authority in the Charter, will invoke the Permanent Council and will bring the Permanent Council together to discuss and to vote on the Venezuelan case with respect to the Charter. That is to say, this is just, uh, you know, my crystal ball, but uh, a little bit, but he's going to put member states on the desk and force him to vote whether they believe that Venezuela no longer, you know, follows the, the principles, the norms of, demo of democracy like, uh, like Eric explained and that are laid out I I in the charter. And states will have to decide. For me, Eric, there have been several tests. This is the test now. This is the point at which we can say the charter is dead, right? And we can talk about what that means. Or, hey, the tr they voted. They voted in favor of democracy. And, and, and Eric will have to say the charter is well, alive, 
and functioning, right? Uh, at least for a while. Uh, and, you know, he, he wants, it seems to me, to put countries uh, and say, you've got to decide and be, in, be consistent in these issues of democracy, of human rights, etc. I think that will be an important point um, for him and for the OAS and for member states. So this brings me to the United States. So to your question, Eric, I mean, clearly, certainly in this administration, democracy and democracy promotion has been a priority. It is an interest. It is not sort of a moral or ethical thing that we want to be. It is at the core of our interest in the region, right? And there are a number of reasons uh, for that. However, th it is true that there was always concern that if we lean forward and we were very critical of, let's say, Hugo Chavez when he was around, that, that that would be used, manipulated by him and others to say the United States always oh, intervening, is imposing, it's violating sovereignty. You, you know the, the, the rhetoric, right? And so the United States was kind of not on the fence, but not leaning forward very far. I'll make a second prediction. Uh, I think that uh, at this point, I think the United States will lean forward, uh, will take a very clear, very vocal position, and even say leadership position, prior to the meeting of the Permanent Council of the OS, to start bringing countries together, trying to build the consensus necessary, so that when, you know, when, that when they meet, the, the vote, as you know, will be baked, so to speak, and there will be a sufficient number of member states voting in favor of the, of the charter in the, in the Venezuelan case. Uh, because I think it's clear now that not playing a leading role, not leaning forward, will in many ways undermine our interest and our promotion of democracy in the world in ways that hasn't happened since dictatorships, I suppose. So we are, again, with respect to the United States, at a pivotal moment as well, with respect to now beginning to take a, a more pronounced, clear position on democracy with respect to Venezuela at, at the OAS. And finally, Eric, to your last point, what are tools, what are the tools that, that are available? I remember when I was in government, uh, you know, people would come and say, oh, you guys aren't doing enough on Venezuela. Or, or you guys aren't doing enough on Bolivia or Nicaragua. And I'd always ask, what is it exactly do you think we should do, right? Uh, is it economic sanctions, right? Uh, an embargo? No, no, not that, okay. Well, you're, you're coming to me and I was at the Pentagon, so I know you're not coming for an invasion or anything <laughs> like that. So what is it exactly? And it, I mean, it was, I was being a little, but it's an important question because there is an expectation that the United States can change outcomes in the region like maybe they did during the Cold War. And that's, that's simply not true right now. It, it, we, can, we can be clear, we can be vocal, we can put members, uh, individuals, or government officials on some list for corruption and human rights violations, absolutely. But at the end of the day, those aren't gonna change outcomes that much, right? At the end of the day, those are just expressions of support for democracy, and that's important, Eric. But in terms of tools and having an influence in changing outcomes on the ground in Nicaragua, in Bolivia, in Venezuela, the United States has limited tools, Eric. And in fact, I would agree that if we push too hard on the internal issues, then it can be counterproductive and hit us back. So we can have a broader discussion here about those tools, but I think we have to manage those expectations that somehow the United States has the kind of influence can truly change outcomes and especially the process of, you know, demo democracy or the practice of democracy in the region. Now, those are terrific comments and this is exactly why I asked you the question because, you know, this whole idea of, you know, support for democracy, sure, it's a talking point, it's rhetorical, but it has to be leavened with reality. What can you actually get done? Uh, and, and as I ask similar question again to all the panelists and Cynthia will come back to you and start with you in terms of the broader tools and expectations of democracy and how can we promote that in the, in the Western Hemisphere. The, the question that, uh, that, that keeps coming up to me then is if you take that to its logical extension, well, if we are saying that we really don't have the ability to affect too much on the ground, should we not just move on? 
and should we treat Latin America, the Western Hemisphere, and I, I put this in the U.S. terms, because again, I'm from Washington, that's my perspective, and others will have a different perspective, and I accept that, but from my perspective, and, and this is intended to be provocative, should we not see then Latin America as essentially like other regions of the world, where if democracy is there, that's great, uh, but, you know, we have other interests and we should pursue those, and democracy is something that, you know, we can say things and do things, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. I get, well, how do we think through those very real policy issues? Because it goes to the issue of priorities, right? And yeah. nobody's talking about invading Iraq in Latin America or anything like that. I mean, it's, I'm, all that craziness off to the side. But the point is, you know, you do have a certain bias in the Western Hemisphere, at least since the end of the Cold War, that I was a part of, many people in the room have been a part of, in promoting democracy in the Western Hemisphere as, and it was a talking point in the State Department when I was there, democracy is the only quote-unquote legitimate form of government in the Western Hemisphere. Have we walked away from that? Should we walk away from it? Am I, I'm being intentionally direct and provocative. <laughs> intentionally so, right? So feel free to come back at me because I'm not, I just want to, but, but these are really important questions for the policymakers. Cynthia, to you. Yes. Uh, and there are no wrong answers, by the <laughs> way, so, uh, you know. <laughs> very, very big questions. Yes. Uh, I agree uh, very much with what uh, no, Frank uh, said, and I think, first of all, I also agree with the premise that democracy is important, and it's in part the democratic process in itself, but beyond that, democracy has a lot to do with development. I mean, again, in the, my case, the Prue case, it's something like $600 million that was stolen. Uh, you can go around the hemisphere with the amounts that some of these different authoritarian governments uh, stole. Uh, I think there's this image because Prue was open to the market that uh, that was a good thing, but there were a lot of problems with corrupt presidents asking for bribes, et cetera, et cetera, which hurt uh, business. And nowadays, and I'm sure, again, people familiar with Central America, no, Mexico, uh, oh, much of this uh, corruption is linked to organized crime. And this is also a very serious problem. And corruption, and one of the questions you posed to us, corruption is very unlikely to be revealed without a free press. Now, the reason why we know about Joaquin Ramirez is because Univision and Cuarto Poder did the investigative journalist work. That was not going to happen under an authoritarian you know, regime. So I think there's some real, uh, real value in this process that we have to, uh, to keep in mind. Is it hard? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's really hard to define democracy. And I began my talk talking about you know, the disqualification of the candidates. Why did the U.S. Department of State not say anything? I mean, I think a little bit around the lines you were saying, well, what are we going to get out of this? We're not going to say this election is wrong, so what's good? We're, we're not going to say it's an authoritarian regime. So why should we get into this? And it's complicated, and we, we, we don't even know for sure that the electoral authorities were doing this for political reasons, so... Again, why? <laughs> no, but again, coming back to Frank's point, just to say, in my view, and, and Secretary General Amagro's view, uh, to voice a criticism and a concern, it's not necessarily to sort of throw the baby out mm -hmm. with the bathwater, and to show you're paying attention, to show you're, you know, you're working with other countries, and we've talked about this before. I mean, you know, if the Department of State had decided to be a little bit more vigorous. It could have worked with Almagro, maybe got some points there. And just sort of, and let's work on this inter-American democratic or Obviously, it's extremely vague. You know, at the moment, um, it, because it's so hard to define, because it's so hard for everybody to be consistent, but I think, you know, we could work on it and get it a little bit more specific, a little bit more elaborate to cover a little bit more cases and try to send some more warning signals and guidelines. Go to Frank and then just, Miriam. Just, and then just real yeah. quick, sure. Eric, you just said something a little while ago that reminded some, me of something that political scientists used to say in the 80s and 90s is, you know, is democracy the only game in town, right? Uh, back then, it was. There was no visible potential alternative to democracy, however imperfect it may have been. And so what, it's an interesting question to ask, is, is democracy the only game in town today? as we see the regressions that we're seeing, not in every country, right, but, but in a lot of the countries. And, and if not, what's the alternative, right? 
What's the alternative? Because, you know, when we talked about this in the... I was a student in 1990s. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, was, you know, th th these are largely endogenous factors, right? This is where the true test comes. It's not the exogenous factors, not the U.S. or the OAS or other international instruments that can bring to bear influence and pressure to ensure uh, or to protect democracies. At the end of the day, as Cynthia was saying, is these are internal processes. And if there isn't a commitment to reform, right, and isn't, you don't deal with the issue of corruption that I talked about, then this, we're going to stay in this road for a long, regardless of what Amago does or whatever the United States might do. This is a terrific conversation. I'm having a lot of fun. I hope you are too. <laughs> uh, Miriam, to you. <laughs> yeah, well, again, I think it's a terrific conversation. I mean, um, when we discuss tools, uh, obviously... Is your microphone on? Oh, no. So when we discuss tools, obviously these tools are not alone. These tools are, are related and supported by certain principles, certain norms. These are tools that belong to certain institutions. These institutions are comprised of, in this case, the case of the OAS, of specific governments. And I think that that dynamic is that can, which is a dynamic that could allow us to be uh, optimistic or, <laughs> or <laughs> pessimistic. If we, if we understand the, the from this perspective, if we look at what has happened throughout the region, since the moment this, that the uh, uh, Inter-American Democratic Charter was uh, approved, was enacted, we will see like the, the confrontation within the region in regards to these principles. In fact, the day that the charter was, was approved, Venezuela tried to intru introduce uh, uh, like changes in the language whereby instead of saying that considering that the Charter of the Organization of American States recognizes that representative democracy is indispensable for the stability, p uh, peace, and development of the region, Venezuela tried to introduce mm -hmm. the idea of particip Participa participatory democracy. So even though participatory democracy may sound like something perfectly acceptable and normal, uh, that had a huge connotation and a huge implication in terms of trying to change that basic consensus in the region regarding democracy, regarding democracy as the only game in town. Because behind the participatory democracy, and we also have uh, other adjectives for democracy, like the citizen democracy in Ecuador, and the, uh, the sovereign democracy in Russia, and our the Venezuelan participatory democracy then evolved into Democracia Participativa y Protagonica, and it finally <laughs> ended in the Socialismo del Siglo XXI. <laughs> so, uh, so the only game in town is exactly what happened in the region. I think there was a very concerted effort to dislocate and to deconstruct that basic uh, consensus in the region. If the region had had a basic consensus, these tools would have been easy, easily applied. I mean, they were easily, say easily, they were applied in certain cases where there was kind of consensus in the case of the coup in Venezuela and later on in the, the Honduran case, of course. This was not easy, there were the debates, but the, I think the basis of what has happened in the region throughout these, these years and that explains why it, these tools have seem to be so ineffectual is that the, the, the inter-American system works on the basis of consensus, works on the basis of governments being in agreement to use the tools. And one of the main say, uh, objectives of the alliance that took power in Venezuela initially, the so-called Bolivarian alliance, or however we want to call it, was to try to change the functioning not, all, not only of the hemispheric uh, dynamics, but also globally. I mean, you read the, the documents of the, of the pre-Chavez movement when they were still in, in uh, like a conspiratory phase uh, inside the, the armed forces. They were very focused on changing the, say, uh, the dynamics of the international uh, system and particularly the hemispheric system. And once uh, the, the additional countries that formed the ALBA came into place as a coalition, that purpose of 
renaming democracy or questioning whether the representative democracy was the game in town, because it's not only if it's democracy just like that, it's a representative democracy that entails separation of power, se uh, alternation in power, the rule of law, uh, I mean, all the basic tenets with which you started the conversation to discuss whether those tenets and those principles and those values were still uh, legitimate and were still relevant for the region. Mm -hmm. And I think what has happened throughout these years has been a systematic erosion, a systematic questioning of those basic tenets. And once in a while, this discussion serves countries that are democratic. Uh, uh, and we have seen it very clearly with some of the attacks and some of the difficulties that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has faced, which I totally agree, that's an amazing institution. It, it's, it's an amazing institution, and here inside NED, and we have conversations, and uh, re uh, like uh, members of the Africa team or Asia team are always like kind of very jealous. impressed. They're jealous. Jealous, <laughs> or, or I don't know if there's anyone here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they tend to be pretty impressed with the fact that we have these institutions. However, these institutions obviously have the limitations of, it, this is not the European Union, of course. I mean, in the case of Latin America, the, this paragraph that I was reading ends with, uh, well, the purpose of the OAS is to promote and consolidate representative democracy with due respect for the principle of non-intervention. So at certain points, we run mm. into that wall, yeah. and that's the main excuse. Right. I mean, this is still a, an institution based on specific governments. Those are the, the main players. So sovereignty, non-intervention can play a, a significant role in many well, Absolutely, and as we turn to Eduardo for his comments, I'm sure you've got a number uh, to, to follow up with, and we'll give you the time to do it. <laughs> uh, but this is a critical point, Miriam, that you've just hit on. This idea of absolute sovereignty across the region means nobody can say anything about me at any time mm -hmm. if I reject it, if I choose not to allow them to right. do that. And what that does is that, I mean, Frank, you spoke eloquently about the democratic institutions that are available, but they're useless if, it, my word, not yours, uh, if a country X says, I'm a sovereign country, I don't accept the jurisdiction of, you know, this body or this institution or, or the ability of country Y to speak out against me because your conception of democracy is different from mine. And Miriam, you also brought that into the conversation really effectively that, you know, some uh, leaders, countries, whatever, not naming any names necessarily, but the point is that democracy has been used as a tool to transform governance in a way that in fact ends up being non-democratic. Mm. And again, those are my words, not yours. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's kind of the logical progression that one sees. And the question then is how do you get back onto the democratic track and pull back to the original conception of what democracy mm. actually yeah. was? No coalitions that will yeah. emerge. Yeah. Eduardo, you've been patient. To you. I don't want to be sort of on the, the outside. Yeah, Mike. It's, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's great that we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, restoring or giving back the OAS some value after about 15 years of really trashing it. But I want to continue trashing it. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and, and to me, you know, the OAS ha is really a club of presidents. Uh, nothing more, nothing else in a call. Yes, it has some respectable dimensions of it, the commission, you know, and, 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 so, and, and so forth. But, uh, but frankly, the OAS and the charter specifically doesn't move unless, as Miriam said, there's absolute consensus. And so, you know, whenever oppositions have been trying, you know, and, and you can look at the range of cases, the Bolivian opposition tried to use the, uh, the, the OAS to, to, to uh, basically, you know, challenge some of Evel's uh, attempts at consolidating power. The Venezuelan opposition tried to use the OAS and failed. So this is a club of presidents. And until the OAS in some measure changes to allow for the charter changes, to allow for, you know, uh, at least the opposition or maybe even NGOs to bring up some kind of, you know, charges like this. And that, that's why I think Frank is correct. I think maybe now there will be an, an opportunity, but something has happened. The other thing I want to say, and I think, you know, we've kind of skirted around this issue. The reality is that at least since 9-11, since the region has changed. And I say 9-11 not only because of what happened here, but let's not forget that Colin Powell was stuck in Peru, right, 
on 9/11 and couldn't come back because because of the of the the banning of the of the but that was the day in which the charter was signed but perhaps the day in which the charter was signed was also the day in which it changed and it changed for a variety of reasons in part because the coup against Hugo Chavez the ability that the Venezuelans had to construct a very significant coalition uh, throughout the Americas and they consolidated a coalition largely using tools like, uh, like Petro Caribe. For example, I've worked extensively in the Dominican Republic and in Haiti over the last decade. And one of the fascinating things about both of those countries is how incredibly dependent they were on Petro Caribe for their financial well-being, for the health of their democracy. And so when you go through the, the region, if you look at El Salvador, if you look at, you know, if you look at any, even, I know you, you didn't want to talk about the English-speaking Caribbean, <laughs> but even the English-speaking Caribbean well, has had, you know. No, some, only because of the proud uh, democratic history right. there at the different part of the world. Right, but no, yeah, of course, but, but in terms of the, the, the way in which Petro Caribe secured critical votes for Venezuela at critical moments, right? Nobody is going to vote against Venezuela. And even, you know, if we look at other countries, Ambassador Frechette is here, you know, look at Colombia, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to <coughs> appear as a great defender of, of former President Uribe, but the reality is that at least since 2010, the equation with Venezuela, with Venezuela has changed dramatically, and it has been impossible, impossible to get the Colombian government to vote on anything against Venezuela, largely because it has a domestic, yeah. very difficult domestic negotiation to, to deal with. So I think we have to understand that some of these domestic political dynamics have an influence over this, this equation. Let's take a look at Brazil. Brazil today, you know, uh, uh, has a new president, a new president who appears to be friendlier to the OAS, right? And, or at least friendlier to, to, to this idea that, that we might have a, a, a more functioning uh, 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 organization. But what is happening with the case of Brazil, you already have people like Evo, you already have Sanchez Serén in, in, uh, in El Salvador. And others who are going, and of course Venezuela, who are even going as far as not recognizing the government of Brazil. So we have a, you know, there is no consensus around notions of democracy, that only game in town that you were talking about in the 1980s and 90s, Frank. I mean, there, there is no consensus. I mean, you know, I think the... the the idea that democracy is representative democracy probably collapsed around 9-11, all right? And what became acceptable in the region is this idea of, you know, dictador uh, 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 suelos, right? Like, mm. like as, as Almagro has called, you know, uh, re-electing themselves uh, uh, indefinitely. Uh, the idea that, that somehow single party systems are fine, right? That, uh, that there's... There, you know, that, that political parties are, in fact, uh, are, are something, ana you know, uh, completely anathema to democracy, that the, mo the more democratic systems are those who actually concentrate power and have a single dominant view of what's good for the country. Again, I'm being, I'm being sort of redundant, but when you look at the OAS in this context, the OAS, maybe it'll recover some space, but, Frank, I don't think that even that, that, uh, that council meeting will be as, you know, you know, perhaps you're going to, your, your, um, you know, your optimism is, uh, is, is contagious, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm of the pessimistic school and, uh, and, uh, I, I think, you know, it's going to be very difficult for, for the OAS to change, uh, or at least to have the kind of dramatic impact to change the equation throughout the hemisphere, right? And let me just, let me just say one final, one final thing about this. All of these views, and in fact, I, I guess the most common question I get now from journalists, and you probably get them even more than I do, is, you know, is Venezuela going to collapse next month? You know, I mean, look, there's hyperinflation of 750,000. You mentioned dozens of characteristics of why Venezuela will collapse, right? And, uh, and nearly every one of our countries is sort of predicting the collapse of Evo, the collapse of this, that, and the other. Look, uh, I've worked in Haiti for the last five years. Haiti isn't collapsing, all right? Uh, and uh, I lived in Bolivia when Bolivia had 26,000% hyperinflation, right? Venezuela, 750% inflation <laughs> is nothing, all right, by comparison. So you have a long ways to go, and these regimes are extraordinarily resilient. You know? They're very resilient in the context of the absolute control that they have over key institutions. 
Let's remember, those of us who are old enough, I don't know if Eric, you're as old as I am. Well, but, not quite, you know, but I'm done. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, Frank doesn't remember the 90s, right? <laughs> you know, but, but those of us who do remember, you know, the, the collapse of the military, we know that, you know, that the military took an awfully long time to, to be pushed out. And it really was when the international community came behind the movements, the pro-democracy movements. I don't think that there is consensus in the region today that we have to push out Maduro, that we have to push out Evo because they're undemocratic. I think the international community still believes that these are democratic regimes. Okay? These are powerful comments. Uh, I personally would love to follow up, but I know that all of you would like to as well. So we're going to give you the chance to ask some questions and comments. Uh, we'll take a group of three. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Alejandro Sanchez, I write now and then for Jane's Defense Weekly. I'm also Peruvian, so let's see how much of a cynic I can be. Uh, <laughs> one term nobody has used so far, but we usually apply it to Latin American politics, is continuismo. The perpetuation of one political party and one, uh, or one president. And leaving aside um, Venezuela and Bolivia, because there are, you know, we talked about them quite a bit, most other countries, even U.S. allies, are behaving the same way. Colombia, Santos is a two-time president. He was elected because he was supposed to be the successor of Uribe before the, the rift. Uribe was so popular that he changed the constitution, and he tried to change it again so he could be re-elected more than, more than one time. In, in Uruguay, we have President Vázquez, who succeeded his, his predecessor, his party friend, President Mujica, uh, Mujica who, who followed um, Vázquez. Even in, in Mexico, you have the, the, the return of the PRI, the, one of the most corrupt political parties in all of Latin America, who ruled with an iron fist Mexico for eight decades. But people voted for that party once again. So I guess my question is, when it comes to Latin America as a whole, don't you think that it's just almost in our DNA, and I say our because I'm one of them, it's in our DNA to just really just support this one political party over and over again, and doesn't matter if it's you know, left or right, there's going to be this perpetuation of one ideology indefinitely almost. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. Uh, from and could we argue that a strong man or woman of infrastructure, and the last Venezuelan dictator, just as well. You know, a lot of the roads that we currently have in Venezuela are because of him. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. My name is Alex Fraser. I work in the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And I'd like to press you a little further on the tools. I heard a lot of great analysis, and I heard a lot of the complexities of U.S. response and how difficult that can be, particularly in the face of the ALBAs and pressing too hard could be counterproductive. So I'd like to ask you for more prescriptive tools for the U.S. policymakers, and I'd like to frame it in two, two camps. One is the ALBA camp, the very sort of left flank, and then also the countries like Peru, others who are, tend to be pro-market democracies but have a lot of growth to go still in the democratic realm. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Thank you. Mike. Parties. So why don't you uh, kick us off here with this round and uh, with the first question about continuismo? Yeah, continuismo is uh, is obviously you know one of the one of the reasons why constitutions, in fact, limited re-election. That was really the the central reason why you know we had limited to four years, not even non-consecutive uh, re-election. I mean, this has always been a recurrent pattern in Latin American thinking. And yet also what has been a recurrent pattern of political thought in Latin America is the notion of changing constitutions and, 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 staying, uh, and staying in power for a long time. I mean, in, in some measure you can say, you know, whether you look at, uh, let, let's, let's go out of, the, out of the South America and Central America for a moment. You know, the Dominican Republic, all right, has a, a phenomenal case of continuismo right now from, you know, uh, the PLD has essentially governed uh, uh, that country, just President Medina just got reelected. He changed the constitution to get himself reelected, you know, and they didn't even need 
uh, you know, a, a constituent assembly to, 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 to change the constitution. So, so this is a, you know, the, the notion of continuismo has some pros and cons. I mean, if you go back to our own uh, writings in the, in the 1990s about, you know, parliamentarism versus, versus uh, pr presidentialism, Juan Linz made some great criticisms of, uh, of, uh, of, presidential, uh, of presidentialism in, in large measure aimed at, you know, the fact that what, it, what do you do with a successful, good president after four years? He has to, be, he has to be, be, be ousted. And what do you do with a bad president when he's only been in office six months, right? You, we didn't have any tools to, to get him out. So a lot of this is part of that mix. The reality, though, is that uh, you know, whether you're a good or a bad president in, in, uh, in the context of your country or my country or any of our countries, presidents... And no matter what, you know, no, no matter how small the country and how small the economy is, for some reason, when you get into power, you don't want to leave, right? And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, that un until we're able to create the institutional mix, the permanent institutional mix to, to prevent people from staying in office or modifying the Constitution. You know, I don't, I don't want to sound too much like an Americanist, an American uh, purist about you know, the, the Constitution in the United States, or certainly I don't want to sound like Ted Cruz, but, you know, the reality is that one of the great things about, about this Constitution is the kinds of locks that it has in terms of, of, uh, of constitutional amendments. When it is so easy to modify the Constitution by a simple legislative majority, forget it. You know, why am I not going to change it to stay in another four years? You know, and that has to do a lot with, you know, the fact of the matter is that you know, and, and again, when you, when you look at the logic of the middle class and how dependent the middle class still is on, po on politics in the region, you know, there is nothing worse in the region than unemployed politicians, <laughs> right? Because there is nothing in the private sector that absorbs them. They don't give speeches for fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 or $250,000, right? They, what, what happens with unemployed politicians in the region is that they're out. And they constantly search, uh, search for mechanisms to stay in. So again, you know, going back to the, the early literature, the, 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 the Linz and, and Valenzuela kind of debate, one of the real problems is the, the inability to rotate and circulate patronage in an equitable fashion between the opposition and the, and, 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 and the, and the, the party in, in office. So, so anyway, it's more complex than, than, the, than the answer I've given you. But, you know, it's a, it, it is a, continuismo is a permanent feature of our countries. And w with such weak institutions, it's going to be very, very difficult. And let me just end with one thing. You know, we, we have uh, now sort of seen the Brazilian case. Uh, most analysts, most journalists have sort of seen Brazil as, look, there we go again, you know, another unsuccessful democracy. But let's turn that around and look at it a different way, you know. Maybe this is the way in which democracy in Latin America is supposed to work, right? I mean, look, they have provide, you know, they have jailed people, right? Very, very prominent people and very, very prominent uh, politicians. I was just reading a report that in terms of jail time, over a thousand years in jail time have been provided to, to these, to these uh, the people that they've convicted. No other country in Latin America has been able to do that. And, and yet the system hasn't collapsed, and yet the system appears to be still, still working. So maybe rather than looking at it as a negative characteristic, maybe Brazil is, is sort of, you know, let's, let's, let's put a positive spin on that. Yeah, I think that's so. exactly right, and particularly in the context of Brazilian institutions, which remain strong and working, right? Mm -hmm. Lava Jato hasn't ended. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's still going on, and it's separate and apart from the impeachment process. Exactly. Uh, and whatever we think about the impeachment and all that, was it wise, et cetera, it was clearly constitutional. Right. And I think that this is, a, this is an important point that you've raised, so thank you for that. Uh, Miriam, let's continue with that uh, conversation. You being with the NED, I'd like to jump ahead to this question about prescriptive, right? Uh, we've talked a lot about tools, but, you know, the reality is some of them may work, some of them may not. So help us think through additionally what some of those points might be. But anything you might also want to drop into the conversation about constitutions, because Eduardo has, has raised a very important point. Uh, you know, constitutions are supposed to govern societies. And yet if they're changeable at the whim of somebody from the left or the right or some other part of the spectrum, they become political tools rather than, a, than, a, than a, a, a way to organize a society and create stability and rules of the game and all that. So 
is it one of the potential tools, uh, for example, from the NED perspective or from other perspectives to be able to work with countries in terms of their constitutions and, make, and, 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 and help this become really a bedrock of society? Uh, help us think through that. I am not a constitutional expert, so what I might be suggesting might be completely stupid. And I'm ready to admit that. Uh, much of what I say is probably is, but, uh, but, but it's a question because it, is, it does come up so often in, in the Western Hemisphere. Can I, can I talk about continuity? Please. <laughs> y you may. You may. <laughs> we'll continue with the continuity. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <Not> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, just a brief comment. I, I really, I'm really very skeptical about persons such as so and so is in the DNA. So and so, I'm usually skeptical about uh, you know statements that start by saying, um, "Oh, thanks." That uh, something is the in the DNA, whether it's Latin America, the Arab world, uh, whatever. I mean, I think those are we have to look at those uh, statements very cautiously, which doesn't mean that continuismo is not a problem in the region. However, they have been they are uh, currently in the region. There are very different ways of addressing continuation in power. You have a country such as Mexico that does not allow re-election, period. And those are Latin Americans. Their DNA may be a little bit different from other parts <laughs> of the region. However, that's something like um, uh, embedded in their constitutions and their, their way of looking at things. They have allowed recently for re-election at, uh, at the legislative uh, level, but they still have this very strong prohibition at the executive uh, level, which may or not be a, a good idea, however, that, that exists in the region. In the case of Colombia, after, after um, Uribe's uh, third attempt to change the constitution, that was not allowed. Santos has already run twice, but no more uh, re-elections. I mean, the constitutional court reversed the re-election clause. So I wouldn't be surprised that after this uh, wave of re-election uh, euphoria in the region, we may run into I some, so. uh, again, b because this has happened in the past. I mean, in the case of Venezuela, for example, it was, there was a clear prohibition in the Constitution to allow for a re-election. Uh, uh, there needed to be two electoral periods prior to allowing re-election, which was a very bad idea, by the way. Because, as you said, those, el those pr former presidents that had been re-elected once were like unemployed for 10 years, and all they did was try to be re-elected afterwards, and both governments were not the best. So, but I think that the menu regarding re-election and continuismo is, is, is more varied than just mm -hmm. saying that, I mean, that's all th that is done in, in Latin America. And also there is a difference between re-electing the same person and re-electing the same party. I think that's also different. I mean, we will not get into all sure. the discussion, but I think that also that's different. Uh, it's uh, one thing is a hyper-personalization of politics, whereby the former president seeks uh, indefinite re-election, but just for him or her, not, it's not a party issue, it's not, a, it's, uh, it's not an institutional issue, it's basically allowing for the same per person to remain in office. And another thing is, the, the fact that there's a party system and one of those parties prevail, that may prevail for a longer period. But when, anyway, mm. there is a, it's an interesting discussion. It also has a lot to do with uh, institutional and constitutional arrangement. <laughs> Our constitutions, I mean, Latin American constitutionalism is very problematic. Uh, constitutionalism in, in Latin America is understood as a political tool. It has that connotation. Constitutions are understood as political programs, and that's the, the, the starting point of this idea was basically the Mexican Constitution, the Revolutionary Constitution of 1917. And since then, that, that pattern of a programmatic political constitution has, has, I mean, has, has deepened its roots in Latin America. So uh, every so a constitution and a change in a constitution and a constitutional assembly and a constitutional reform is part of the menu of uh, institutional and political tools. So, it, and that's very problematic. No. And uh, so, yes, constitutions can be used in a very positive, constructive way, but they can also be used in a very, uh, how do you call it, very 
pragmatic and very politicized fashion. Well, we've seen that. Uh, and that has uh, happened uh, often. And yeah. just and and you see Latin America, not all, are not all of the countries. I mean, some are less prolific in terms of constitutions, but just to go back to my beloved country, this is the 28th constitution in Venezuela. So, and say, uh, and constitutions have been used in a very, in a very uh, politicized uh, fashion. Um, I w I, in terms of um, dictators, are there are good dictators, bad dictators? I think that's something we should address. <laughs> 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 I mean, they're, they're all dictators. but I mean, I, I think that question. I hope someone else will ask. Uh, will answer well, it. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll if pitch the, that the to Frank if he's willing to uh, to <laughs> the, deal with it. Yeah, the the Martinelli, the Correa, Chavez, we're all. Yeah, it. the tools. Uh, and I just, if I may, I would like Please. to. Okay. I would like to leave a question here. I mean, based on our previous conversation about the, the OAS. I think one thing we would like to assess for the future, and that's why I think we could be pos uh, pessimistic or optimistic, is if we agree that this, the difficulty, the regional difficulty to address uh, democratic regression in the region is based on the emergence of a new, uh, new coalition in the region that made that very more difficult. My question is, is there a possibility of an emergence of the emergence of a new coalition that may allow for a more democratic approach uh, uh, to reenact and revive uh, yes. the content of the Inter-American Democratic yes. Charter, the, this, the principles of democracy. Yes. Are these you know, uh, signals coming from the Secretary General of the OAS who explicitly has said that, has said that his commitment is to abide by the principles of the Inter-American yeah. Democratic Charter and of the OAS, are the new r political realignments emerging in the region signals of the possibility of a, uh, a new coalition that may enable these tools and this charter to be more effective? I think that's, that is a question that may mm -hmm. be worthwhile. Well, it's an excellent question. Frank, why don't we uh, yeah. continue on that line? Absolutely. Sort of just to uh, respond to <coughs> to Alex Fraser's question and, and sort of respond to something that uh, Eduardo made. And again, maybe this shows my optimism or naivete, uh, either way. Um, you know, so 1991, you have the Declaration of Santiago, right? That was a very pivotal, important moment in the commitment of the region to protecting uh, democracy. For those right? who don't know what that is, just quickly synopsis. Yeah, that was, uh, again, an OAS meeting mm -hmm. in which... It's all uh, millennium. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, OAS meeting <laughs> held in Santiago, uh, Chile, in which uh, member states were very explicit in really re-emphasizing, not saying anything new, but really un doubling down at a time when democracies or these fragile democracies were transitioning to democracies. These presidents, to use the word that, that Eduardo says, this, these democratic presidents says, let's do something internationally to protect our democracies, right? against internal threats such as the military and otherwise. Ten years later, that process is institutionalized with the Democratic Charter, 1991, 2001. I, I, I think, Alex, that, and I've been thinking a lot about this, I, I think that with the, the el desgaste, right, the deterioration of the ALBA model, using ALBA for everyone understands that, the ALBA model, right, in the context of the political and e deep economic crisis related to the commodities and the commodities, et cetera, that there is, I think, an opportunity with this Secretary General, with the U.S. playing a leading role, changes in, in Argentina and other places, to do what Miriam is suggesting, which is to build a new coalition of countries that are committed or recommitting themselves to not just democracy at home, but in terms of institutionalizing or giving greater legitimacy tho to those inter-American instruments that the OAS and others have. I, I think that clearly the, 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 the uh, Bolivarianism of the 21st century is not a model. Right? No one is seeking to replicate that. Uh, you see what's happening in Ecuador and the challenges that Correa, who's not apparently going to seek re-election, right? Yeah. So there is an opportunity. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if the United States and others take this moment and begin to build, lead that consensus of countries to reassert, re, 
um, reaffirm our commitment, the region's commitment to 1991 and 2001. Uh, it's not going to be easy lifting, right? But I think we're at a moment in the region, the dynamic as it is today, and what I think will happen in the next couple of years, to do that from a diplomatic standpoint. I don't know, Eric, from a sort of constitutional engineering process what we can do. I think, and this is about the United States, this is what we can do with other countries to bring back the charter, right? And we are now, in the next months going to be at a pivotal moment as I, as I, as I mentioned. So I hope we, we take advantage of it. In terms of the strongman, real quickly, strongmen always show big public works to say, look how wonderful I am, I'm building a bridge or I'm building a road, but in net terms, right, at the end of the day, what strongmen do to stability, to the institutionalization of, of democratic rule, of stability, of human rights, in net terms, Strong men don't do well. Their performance at the end of the day usually um, uh, ends up being much worse than, where, than when they started. Thanks very much. Cynthia, to you. Uh, we have a lot on the table. We do. We do. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree uh, you know, very much with what uh, you know, Frank was saying following up on Miriam, that there is an opportunity uh, here, that there is a shift in the region. Uh, obviously, the changing economic patterns has really hurt yeah. you know, the ALBA uh, countries. Uh, I might add, too, that I think the image of China is somewhat less positive than a couple of years ago. China mm -hmm. has had its own problems recently. And for better or worse, I think Obama's image is also positive, which does raise the question about our uh, election. So I, I do see this um, a, a moment of opportunity yes. that I mm -hmm. hope we'll be able to, uh, to seize. Now, on the, uh, oh, and coming back actually to this tools question, one thing sure. that Frank and I were talking about, I, I think that the United States uh, in Venezuela, and perhaps Miriam would want to comment on this, the United States in uh, indicting uh, members, you know, uh, officials within the government uh, for yeah. uh, drug trafficking crimes, other dra uh, this kind of sends a signal yeah. that, that can be helpful as well as perhaps something that mm -hmm. uh, can, can be done elsewhere as yeah. when there are uh, crimes. So, so just something to, to think about in the toolbox. Uh, the continuismo question, uh, one of the sayings that I love more than any other uh, is power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it's sad uh, but true. I'd add perhaps a bit to the discussion that the strong men in, of the 2000s did benefit a lot from economic growth mm -hmm. so that it wasn't just kind of the, the caudillo. Uh, and, and I'd add as well, too, and this is perhaps a, uh, <laughs> a, a pitch for my, Miriam knows I've been working a long time on the issue of plurality versus uh, runoff, but in quite a few cases, uh, these Cordillos trying to continue in power are able to divide the opposition. And in these fragmented, now as Eduardo mentioned, we have these fragmented political institutions, the political party, opposition parties are often divided. So take the case of Daniel Ortega, who we haven't mentioned uh, today. Uh, I would submit that he would not have won uh, his re-election in 2006 if it had not, if there had been a runoff, if there had not been this divided opposition that couldn't come uh, together. The pre um, has really benefited over the years from the divisions between the PAN and the PRD. So again, I think it can, and again, in the case of Peru that we're looking at, obviously Keiko would be the president uh, if there were not a uh, runoff. Well, Nicaragua has elections this year as well, and you have similar yeah. uh, issues that the nation is facing. Of course, we're not talking about it in our own country because their, their election happens two days before <laughs> our own. So <laughs> I think we'll Good have luck. other, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, but, but it's no less real for the Nicaraguans, but the point you raise is a really good one. Really good one. We have time for a couple more questions. Uh, I'm sure that there are. I think I saw a hand. There's one right there. Absolutely, Jim. And then Miles. And this might do it. If we have time, we'll get back. Ambassador. Uh, right here. Yep. Go ahead. Can yeah. I start? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Really great discussion. I'm Jim Swigert from National Democratic Institute. I wanted to come back to the question of corruption in the region because I think the set of challenges that democracy faces that come from the ALBA countries, from the question of, uh, of shifting uh, power to the executives, hybrid regimes, whatever you may call it, um, is different from a set of challenges that you see across the hemisphere, which is one that is familiar. It comes from uh, 
non-state actors and, and capture of state institutions uh, and issues of political finance, which I think come to the core of the, of the health of, of democracy and the possibility of, of building competitive uh, systems that, that are representative and participatory because um, as Chavez was wont to say, he, he was the consequence, not the cause. Mm -hmm. In many cases, it's the failures of political parties, of representative in institutions to reflect the diversity of the electorate that has led to uh, some of the weaknesses we've seen in the region. But when non-state actors, organized crime, criminal elements enter into politics, uh, the whole situation becomes, I think, a little bit more dangerous uh, for democracy. And, and it's, it's harder to really see what's going on. And I wonder uh, what you think about that in terms of uh, a threat for the region, um, what you think about some of the uh, new tools, so to speak, of re of, that we've seen used in, uh, in the recent decade to try and strengthen the capacity of weak judicial institutions. CSIG in Guatemala, there's a new initiative, MOXIE of the OAS, which uh, uh, the OAS is looking at as perhaps a model that could be used elsewhere. So I, I look very for, uh, forward to your comments on Excellent. that. Excellent, thank you. And we have not really talked, other than a brief comments on Nicaragua, we really haven't talked about Central, Central America. America. Yeah. And there are very pertinent questions for that. Ambassador Frechette, please, Milo. And by the way, I, I think that the discussion has been absolutely fantastic. I've enjoyed it. Uh, the first question is, in analyses about what's happening in Latin America, the press, both American and it seems to me Latin American, seems to argue that the reason that people in the region are so upset uh, about uh, corruption is being led by the middle class. And frankly, doesn't make an awful lot of sense uh, to me. And I wonder what, uh, or, or shall we say, there are cases like Brazil, for example, uh, where there are two very divergent groups that have, in fact, uh, benefited from government largesse. One is the working class, and uh, you know the press has argued that the working class has been rising out of the, the lower levels and becoming middle class. And uh, they're upset because now, you know, with the drop in prices in commodities, uh, the government is not as uh, successful as it was before. Uh, you know, it just doesn't hang, but I'd like very much to hear from you. And, and uh, the other question is, with respect to political parties, and here I will refer to Colombia specifically, political parties in Colombia don't really exist anymore. The last time a president was elected by one party, the Liberal Party, was 1994 uh, with Ernesto Samper Pisano. Okay. Uh, now people are elected president of Colombia with agglomerations put together with all sorts of strange groups that don't really go together at all. And I have the sense that without trying to move the, the, the image exactly to Brazil, something happens in, like that in Brazil. I mean, who really believes in what in Brazil? Uh, you know, how many guys remain at the end of the year members of the same party? It's, it's a just continual round, and you can see it just in the last two or three weeks after all of this debate. Thank you. Uh, we're, was there a third here? Yep, all right, go ahead. Sarah, we'll give it to you. Thank yep. you. Hi, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm with the council. And I have a question. I think we've kind of been oh, skirting-ish around the issue, the intersection between the economic models that a lot of these countries promote and the economic, especially macroeconomic trends, and the political decisions or the insertion of civil society into the discussion around politics and policy. Um, a country like Brazil, where admittedly over 54 million people voted for Dilma, and they like her, her campaign. They liked what she was promoting especially looking at Brazil's economic stability and the trends up until now. And I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the intersection between what's happening economically, the economic systems, and the health of democracy and the way in which that influences the way that civil society views democracy. Because I think that's very different from Venezuela to 
Chile or Nicaragua even looking ahead. Thank you. So you've given the moderator a very difficult task because <laughs> in 10 minutes we have four very meaty questions and four <laughs> experts who can deal with all of them, but probably not uh, collectively in 10 minutes. So we will try to do our best. Uh, but these are excellent questions. And I should say, you know, that from the outset before we go to the, the panelists, that, uh, that, that Sarah, you hit on a point that was actually uh, you're right, we have talked about it, we haven't articulated it, and that is this. I mean, with democracy, the advent of democracy, you bring into the political system a lot of people that have been shut out for years. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a good thing, right? Whether it's the down, uh, you know, the lower economic strata, whether it's the indigenous community, whether it's, you know, women with the franchise, whether it's, you know, whoever it is, and this is a very good thing, but it also leads to changes, and it leads to differentiation of demands, and it yeah. leads to you know, uh, power structure changes and all of these things. We don't have time necessarily. I mean, this is a, this is a college <laughs> seminar, Eduardo, <laughs> you, a graduate level <laughs> seminar, right? But, but it's an important question, so I, and I don't want to overlook it. But let's go to you. Uh, you raised corruption, so let's start with you in terms of this round. There was a follow-up question on corruption. Why don't you deal with that, and then we'll come back down the list, and, uh, and Cynthia will give you the last word. Right. Okay, I'll, be, I'll try to be brief. Uh, uh, I just spent a couple of days in, in Guatemala, and... Uh, uh, um, you know, Guatemala is a, is a fascinating case because uh, it shows again in some measure that uh, uh, the role that external actors can play in, in achieving some kind of political change, right? And uh, uh, the role that Sihig ha has played in, uh, in, uh, in Guatemala is, is really quite, quite interesting and it continues to play a very, a very sig significant role. Um, but I won't go much further into that because there's there's a lot there that that especially in your line of work uh, and and what what uh, organizations like like uh, like CHIG, the OAS and the UN and and the US can play I think are very, very uh, are very very important. But I will say that that Guatemala also reflects something quite striking, and that is the extraordinary presence of organized crime and the extraordinary. Uh, um, I, I would say, you know, something that, that has been happening in Central America, perhaps to an extreme state, um, and which is kind of an unintended consequence of, of, you know, drug wars in Mexico and drug wars in the South that have kind of squeezed things right into, into, into the countries of, of Central America. For example, you know, uh, uh, Miriam, the amount of money that has been laundered out of Venezuela, right, Using, uh, <laughs> 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 not that you have any personal knowledge, but, but, but certainly what has happened over the last few years in terms of the amount of money that came out of Venezuela, and it has been laundered the world over, but is now focusing in, in Central America. The banks in Central America are largely, have largely been affected by, by some of this, this, uh, these, these goings on. So, and, and how this affects, of course, you know, uh, who gets elected, who doesn't get elected, because in the end, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at the amount of money it takes to run an election, right, on average, I mean, I, I know from, from having worked in elections myself, but, you know, it's probably easy to, to say that in a case like the Dominican Republic recently, probably over $100 million were spent, right, to, to, to re-elect the president of the Dominican Republic, right? And that's probably average now, right? And uh, because that's how much it takes, not only to pay consultants, right? But also to, to, to pay for, for advertising, to pay for all kinds of things. So, and then the role that the private sector in particular plays in electing and re-electing people. I mean, I think Lava Jato kind of has really illustrated this for Brazil. But I think if you look very carefully at Lava Jato, look at Lava Jato's impact in Peru, Look at Lava Jato's impact in, in Guatemala, in Venezuela, in the Dominican Republic, right? So there is this transnational dimension of these very, very weak electoral laws and the fact that no country, no country is really serious about political party laws, right? Because there's, you know, no political party or even, you know, ambassador, even those very, very little political parties it's not in their interest to have any kind of regulation uh, uh, to, that, that will basically limit their ability to be competitive. So, you know, contrary to what you're saying, they don't see laws as, uh, as you know, what will enable them to be competitive. 
they see laws, you know, basically limiting their ability to accede to, to, to these kinds of, of funding mechanisms. And then very, very quickly, I want to, you know, uh, on, on the uh, Sarah, right? Uh, you know, there, there has never been socialismo del siglo XXI, all right? Uh, Evo Morales did not relocate Decree 21060, all right? I think James Petras is absolutely correct, okay? You know, he, he's talked about how we basically have indigenous neoliberalism. You know, look, we have essentially gone back to state capitalism. Remember when we wrote about state capitalism in the region and we criticized the military and the MNR and everybody for being state? This is state capitalism in, 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 in its, you know, in its old version, right? And, and so in some measure, you know, it's, it's state capitalism with a little bit of a social conscience. And I think there are some very good things that have happened, right? Um, and, and I think some of the criticisms of, for example, what the Brazilian government has done, the new Brazilian government has done uh, uh, in its first few days of, you know, I, I think are probably, you know, well-placed. You can't just all of a sudden do away with some of the social dimensions, you know, some of the things that really gave those regimes legitimacy. By the same token, I think, you know, going back to, I, I guess he's left, but the, the question about good, good and bad dictators, the reality is that over the last decade, all of these guys benefited enormously from the commodity boom. And they had to do something in terms of social spending. And they did it, and it played well for, for them. You know, and, and they also built, built up a lot of infrastructure. But are these guys socialists? You know, they're, they're not. Uh, is this a new economic model that's more just and whatever? No, absolutely not. It still has those very basic characteristics of concentration of, of power. And, and more than anything else, you know, of concentration of economic resources in the hands of a new elite. But still, the model is essentially the same. Yeah. Okay, sorry. No, very important yeah. comments. Miriam, any thoughts? Make sure your microphone's on, please. Yeah. Of your last comment. In many cases, the at least speaking for the Venezuelan case and probably partially for the other cases, sometimes it not, doesn't even qualify as a state capitalism. It's more like crony capitalism, and it's uh, the emergence of uh, like the boliburguesia in Venezuela associated with businesses with the government. So it's uh, it's even worse in, in the sense of, of uh, the, the corrupt nature of a lot of the dealings associated with, with the massive influx of, of resources uh, coming with the commodity boom and handled in very uh, non-transparent uh, fashions without, with no checks and balances, having destroyed the basic uh, institutions that would have allowed for a at least a sounder uh, distribution of, of wealth or a sounder in, in investment of wealth. So even state capitalism may not be appropriate for some, some cases and some, some, some partial experiences uh, associated with this last uh, commodity boom in the region that in a large part of it was administrated by governments uh, associated to the left or the ALBA. ALBA uh, experience. So I think that also raises interesting questions regarding the future of the left in the region. I mean, what remains after these experiences? I mean, the, the 2000s were marked by the emergence of left-wing uh, governments in the region. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of uh, optimism in regards to this this trend. I mean, well, there it was a, I mean, there was a, a discussion. However, after this, at the end of this cycle, what's, what's the assessment? I mean, there are different kinds of lefts in the region that administrated uh, this wealth in different fashions. However, the recent experience in Brazil with the high criticism of the PT and, and even Lula and, uh, and, you know, and, and Dilma, indeed, uh, criticism in regards to Bachelet, which, uh, you know, are the, like, the so-called the good left in, in the region, because the, the bad left in the region, I mean, according to the literature <laughs> that divided the good and the bad, has also uh, shown a very uh, disreputable uh, 
way of, of administrating uh, well. So I think that's an, uh, an emerging topic for a future absolutely for a future uh, discussion. However, corruption is not only in the left, as we have seen clearly in, in Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, elsewhere. So I think coming back to some of the questions regarding corruption, it's one of the most difficult issues to deal with in the region. It has an institutional dimension. It has a I don't know, ethical dimension, it's, uh, it, and this penetration of, of illegal actors, of organized crime, which is not only regional, this, uh, it's associated with uh, illegal uh, circuits coming from far away from the Russia mafia and, and the Chinese who knows what. So <laughs> it's an it's a, it's a international, it's a global problem that has its manifestations in the region. Unfortunately, in, in our region, uh, a very uh, sad uh, con uh, consequence is hyper-violence. I mean, the region has become the most violent region globally, and, and a lot of the violence is associated with, uh, with um, organized crime. Regarding parties, I think, I mean, it's, uh, that's a huge topic, and, and I think that's, uh, well, we need to discuss parties. I mean, uh, nowadays, parties are not what they used to be, obviously. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, different arrangements in, the, in not only the region, globally. And uh, it's, it is, uh, I think it's a puzzling phenomenon in terms of understanding the new format of parties and how they interact with a formal, uh, formal structures. I mean, we need parties in order to present candidates, uh, to seek office, to go through the whole me mechanics of the of representative democracy. However, those parties are very far from being the parties that should fit into that kind of, uh, of, of institutional settlement. So it is, it is I think, it's a, a very critical and relevant question. Your comments about the two left wings remind me of Jorge Castaneda's joke about why does Latin America always fly in circles? Because it has one left wing and one far left wing. <laughs> 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 it's always going. <laughs> it was his joke, not mine. But uh, it reminded me of that. Uh, Frank and Cynthia, we are uh, at time. In fact, we're beyond time. So I will ask you for quick comments. But yeah, to I'll the be, extent I'll you have brief. Please. So I, I've yep. been op uh, optimistic uh, <laughs> this afternoon. I'm going to end by being pessimistic. Because <laughs> I think the questions are very good questions. And they really point to some troubling trends. And that sort of linking the, the ambassador's question and Sarah's question, I mean, there is a sort of rising expectation that came out of the commodities bill, right? That, that middle class, which is really a middle class, it's a non-poor, right? Didn't develop values. It wasn't a middle class that was well, you know, deep rooted in middle classness, right? And now because of the economic crisis that Brazil faces and other countries face, but in particular Brazil, that will sort of continue for the next year or so, that non-poor that had expectations of a middle class is going to be falling back into poor. What are the social and political consequences of that, right, for a country like Brazil, right, who uh, that non-poor spent crazy, right? Everyone bought a car, everyone beat TVs, uh, TVs, and now all of a sudden those standards of living are going to change. And when those expectations are frustrated, that becomes a very serious problem uh, for uh, stability, for democracy, and so on. So, so I think that's a, an important point that we, we shouldn't miss. Um, and finally, to Jim's comment, and this is, this goes to this, to this issue that of what I think is political will, right? And Eric and I have talked about this. So you know, these democracies are, are, you know, we talked about this 20 years ago, they're still incomplete democracies. There is a shallowness to these democracies, in part because there hasn't been a commitment to do the heavy lifting and the kinds of reforms necessary in the social and economic realm to consolidate, to deepen, place roots on these democracies. As a result, they're sort of kind of muddling through. They muddled through okay during the boom, but the gig is up, right? And now all of these contradictions are beginning to, uh, to surface. And in Central America, the, one of the reasons why they haven't been serious about institutional reform and social reform is corruption. These, right? These, there are people who are alliances and relationships with criminal organizations or businessmen who, who have no vested interest in seeing real institutional reform. Right? Uh, I, why will Honduras not have a CSIC? 
right? And they have this sort of version by the OAS that's not quite the same, right? Uh, well, because they don't want to see their politicians and others going uh, to jail. So there isn't, I think, still a real commitment that, in fact, democracy is for them the only game in town, that there is a perversion of democracy that we can work with, and that, and that includes criminal organizations. Powerful comments. Cynthia, you're following some pretty uh, tough acts, but we know you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I am indeed. I am indeed. Uh, I'll try to balance the optimism and the pessimism <laughs> to the tall order. Um, the corruption question, it, it's, it's so important. Uh, I think all of us here agree the, the problem has become much more serious that most Latin Americans no longer say, oh, he robs, but you know, it's okay as long as he does stuff. It's changed because this is related to organized crime. So I think it's gone well beyond the middle class because people who are poor everywhere, they, they, they're very scared about getting robbed and organized crime is the major perpetrator. Uh, so I think uh, this has, uh, has changed. The good news, as others have pointed out, is the CICIG is the, you know, the efforts at control and transparency. Uh, you know, the bad news is how pervasive it is. And it's, so um, the economic development model, I think that brings us back to a sort of point that I was trying to raise at the beginning. And Peru, in some ways, is a really interesting case because basically they did so much right. Now, they've done an awful lot right. They have extremely high economic growth over the last 15 years, probably second, third best in the region, with social inclusion, dramatic improvements mm -hmm. in inequality, much less inequality, dramatic improvements in the poverty rate. So why does this dissatisfaction continue? Now, why are people looking at Keiko Fujimori. Uh, and I think it comes back a little bit again, the problem of elections and promises. And there is the, the, the key problem in Peru is that the engine of growth remains extractive industry and extractive industry continues to have very damaging effects you know, on contiguous indigenous communities. So there's a, a tension there. And I think it's just really hard to resolve. There's, I mean, I remember talking about it five years ago. I kind of, what was, <laughs> I think he was elected at that point of Mali going to do? And, you know, he's tried, I think, really hard to thread the needle, but it hasn't satisfied people. And you have Keiko saying, oh, well, we can just make everything, every, it's going to be hunky dory, and we're going to let the, the illegal mining's going to be just fine. She said, but of course we're going to protect the environment. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> right? But she's saying that, of course, we know somebody around here does kind of the same thing, right? Um, so there are these endemic problems, even in a democracy that has, looks pretty good at what to do. We all together you know, work on this, try to help with solutions, and when we see problems, we, we state them. Well, uh, out, coming out of this, I know at least one thing to do, and that is to continue the conversation, because there is a huge amount uh, for the next round, uh, whether here or there or some other place or institution. But these have been terrific comments. I apologize as the moderator for extending them beyond time, but I thought that the comments that were being made and, and the people who were making them were of sufficient quality to allow the conversation to go on. Uh, but that's my fault. Uh, nonetheless, uh, would you please all join me in thanking our panelists for the terrific presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. And yeah, come back. Join us yes. again. <laughs> well done, Wow. It puts you in a Super. very different